Hello, and welcome to the Heart of Collaboration. And I'm your host, Bernice Belt. And thank you for allowing us into your viewing audience. And we don't take it lightly. I'd like to remind people that uh, we appreciate you taking this time to hang out with us. And we are always grateful that you do. We thank you for passing it along to so many others. And I appreciate all the positive comments and the emails and the text messages and things on Facebook that you have shared with me. And I want you to know that I appreciate how you've encouraged me and strengthened me. And we are continually trying to make sure that we are relevant to you and that we provide enough topics and enough guests so that you know that we're always thinking about you. On this segment of the Heart of Collaboration, we have a super, super human being, and he's my mentor. This is Reverend Dr. Nathan Joyce, who is the pastor of Heartland Worship Center right here in the great Paducah, Kentucky. Welcome, Dr. Joyce. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Bernice. Appreciate it so much. I, I thank you for taking the time because I know enough about what's going on with you and, and Heartland Worship Center and yeah. that you're a stellar dad and husband to know that you have a full plate so I know that you had to juggle some things around so you could be with us. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And, and uh, just so that you'll know, Pastor Joyce has agreed to co-host uh, the pastor series that we'll have when we'll have uh, individual pastors or maybe even panels of two or three pastors in the weeks, months ahead. And we'll be talking about some things that many of you have asked that we cover uh, on the Heart of Collaboration. And so uh, today, uh, the topic with Pastor Joyce is the relevant of the 21st century church and that's going to sound real deep and it is <laughs> but we have a guest today who can break it down for us and so that we'll be able to appreciate and then to comprehend uh, what he has to say today mm -hmm. is that okay pastor that sounds Joyce? Great to me. Yeah. Uh, first i want to ask you what do you believe are the characteristics of the 21st century church mm -hmm. and if you if you believe that the church today is contrary to what you believe the characteristics are we just want you to take the time that you need to clarify yeah that for us? Well, you know, I think that when you think about the, a church, it's always set within a culture around it. And every church has to sort of determine how it relates to that culture. And, um, but but no, no church is immune to the, the, the um, tendency to adopt its culture or to be influenced by its culture in some ways. And so I've been blessed to get to travel around the world, different mission projects, whether in Thailand, Myanmar, Uganda, Ecuador, different places. And so to, to visit the church in many places, and what you see is that um, the church sometimes looks different in different places. And, and so there, there is an influence that happens with, the, with its culture. We're, we're hopefully influencing the culture around us, but we're also influenced by that culture as well. And to, in my mind, there is, a, there is a distinct American church culture that um, our churches have been influenced by the American culture for, for good and for bad, I think. Um, and so we, we, don't, we don't escape that. Um, and so when you think about the church today, you know, we typically are thinking about um, the, the church in America and the church in our, in our region. And, and I think one of the things that, that we see uh, that concerns me, if I could give a concern, yes. is that I think that we adopt, the word I would give to it is the consumerism of America. I think it's influenced the church quite a bit because churches can easily become another business, and we're meant to be we're meant to be a transformative, redemptive community, bringing hope, bringing life to our to, to people and to our communities. But I'm but I'm concerned that uh, you know Americans we're consumers. We 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 uh, we have you know for whatever our economy has been, we're a place generally of abundance, and so we have options to spend our money here or there, mm -hmm. and and because of that, we're used to shopping around, getting what getting what we want, and that sort of thing. And what concerns me about the American church is that that, that same consumerism might be a part of our church where the folks, we'll even use the phrase, I'm church shopping. Mm -hmm. you, you've heard that before. Yes. And and so that consumerism is this, that I go to church to to consume its product, to consume what, you know, this, whatever, the, if the sermon is going to touch my heart or the music or, or whatever the church offers, it's, it's sort of religious goods and to consume those. And so what I'm afraid of that's happened is that the average then churchgoer um, sees themselves as a consumer rather than as somebody who's being equipped and somebody who's being called to be a world changer. And so I, I'm, I'm concerned about that and I think that leads our churches then to buy in some of that consumerism because we're then fighting for people to come to our church or tithe in our church. 
And, and when that happens, we lose the heart of, of the mission, I think, that Jesus has given us. And so, um, so I, I, I really believe one of the primary issues we're going to have for relevance is, is do our churches operate out of a consumerism, which is um, we're here for ourselves. What do you have for us? And if we don't like what you have, then we'll go find it somewhere else. Or will we become communities that are revolutionary? Or will, we be, will we be communities of faith that are revolutionary who feel called to, to, uh, to do something in the world. And I think that will come when we sense a mission to bless the people outside of our church. So churches are either, are either consumed with, with what's going on inside the church or blessing outside. And I think that's what we're gonna see as the issue for us uh, now and in the days to come. I, uh, since a little girl, uh, my parents used to talk to me about the importance of being community-minded now, when I was very small, I didn't know what that meant. All mm -hmm. I saw was what Daddy and Mama yeah. used to do. And what they would do is they would assemble as believers in the local church. Mm -hmm. But then they would go outside the walls of the church, often on during the course of yeah. every week, and they would do ministry outside yeah. the church. When I, when I was a little girl, I learned, I think I was about nine, I learned how to take wallpaper off walls, oh my. clean the walls, prep the walls and put new wallpaper on mm -hmm. the walls. Mm -hmm. And my mother would take me with her when she would do that for the elders right. in the community. Right. And wallpaper was a big thing when I was a little girl and I'm much older than you. You may not <laughs> even remember wallpaper. But I remember how my mother treated that relationship with the elders mm -hmm. and how she treated uh, the wallpaper mm -hmm. thing yeah. as a ministry. Yeah. And she would actually <clears throat> cook the night before, take a full course meal that mm -hmm. day, feed those elders, and she and I would work all day long mm -hmm. until it was we couldn't see outside. Mm -hmm. And and that that's what I remember as a ch child is that when you are edifying people, mm -hmm. it's ministry. Exactly. Uh, do well, you remember any of those stories, maybe from your grandparents? You know what I, what I remember was my, my dad was in ministry. My dad was. Um, a music minister and a youth minister, and um, he he taught me mission from from the time I was young. And we weren't always part of churches that really valued the sense of outward mission mm -hmm. uh, for for the church. We were part of some churches. You know, churches can easily become sort of very social and amongst themselves, and to become clubs amongst themselves where we're going, well, I'm a member, what's my mm -hmm. perks here? Mm -hmm. Rather than I'm a member, what am I called to be and do? Mm -hmm. And so um, I, we traveled a lot on mission trips and that sort of thing. And so, so that got ingrained in me in, in that age. Um, I think we have relevance a little bit mixed up because I think when we think relevance, we think um, style. Mm -hmm. We think all style. Yes, exactly. And, and style, it's not that it's unimportant. I think that when we have a style in churches, um, that that somebody who is not a believer comes into the church and they see they see that we're you know not doing things with a style that's going to somehow um, seem uh, contemporary to some degree. Then I think we're going to maybe seem to be antiquated and they'll think well religion is just this old thing that mm -hmm. that used to be important. Mm -hmm. So I do think style is important, but I think we've missed it a little bit there because I think style is much less important than what I would say is usefulness and. What makes you relevant to somebody who's outside the church? Mm -hmm. Are you useful to their life in some way? And, and we've had kind of the idea that we can gather together and that people are going to be drawn to us in some way. But the truth is, is that the only time I become relevant is who do I feed? Who do I clothe? Who do I listen to? Who do I cry with? Mm -hmm. um, who, do I, who do I speak wisdom into their lives? If, if we're not useful to our communities and to our city, then, then we're probably not very relevant, um, you know, regardless of what our style is. So I, th I think that's part. Of, I think that is part of the issue. When it comes to our young people, I know I know that our elders want to hear the hymns. Mm -hmm. They want to hear the pure messages mm -hmm. that are that are specifically Bible based yeah. and to make it relevant to mm -hmm. to the world that we live in, so that we are better equipped to handle everything mm -hmm. around us. But that consumerism when it comes to young people, mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, many churches near and far have given way to, uh, to the types of music mm -hmm. and the approach to uh, 
biblical studies and, mm -hmm. and all, almost to the point where we are singing songs that don't have God, don't have Jesus, mm -hmm. yeah. or don't have the Holy Spirit mentioned yeah. in the lyrics. And, and we are having programs uh, that draw the youth in terms of how they think mm -hmm. versus make, uh, turning it around so they understand how the Bible applies right. to them in its pure pure state. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I, I, I notice and listen and I watch a washed down or mm -hmm. a rinsed mm -hmm. out type version of yeah. the gospel for our young people. I think that I think this is part of the misunderstanding of relevance that we have. We think that relevance means that we have to um, change our message or soften our message or um, be in a place where, you know, many churches did this. I, I'd say, especially in the 1980s, you had, it became very popular to, to do what was called seeker-sensitive or seeker-friendly mm -hmm. churches. And, and let me say, I would clearly believe churches should think through a lot more what is it like for somebody who doesn't believe, who's seeking to come into your church. Um, are, they, are they not only welcome, but is this a place where you can speak into their lives? I think we need to think through that a lot more. But in these movements, there was the idea that, um, that, that we almost needed to um, water down things to the degree that, that people would just feel completely comfortable in ways that would never challenge their lives. And, and what I think happens in relevancy is um, it's not about changing the message. Because I, in, in my belief, the gospel of Jesus is relevant to lives because it speaks to um, the shame and guilt we have because mm -hmm. of our sin. It mm -hmm. speaks to um, our, our loneliness and our desire to belong somewhere. Um, it, it speaks to our, our self-esteem and our low sense of worth. Um, and, and through the cross of Jesus, God expresses a worth towards us. So there, there are, me in the gospel message, are messages that are relevant to human beings' lives, uh, wh wh wherever they come from, whatever's going on with their lives. Um, and so, so the message doesn't need to be less prominent. I think the message needs to be even, even more prominent because, and as I said before, relevancy is useful. I think maybe we have forgotten this. Maybe we have preached Christian doctrine and biblical teachings, uh, forgetting that those teachings are very, very powerful to impact our lives. Mm -hmm. And we need to remember that because they're not just some beliefs that we hold to that, that don't have an impact on our lives. They, they, they definitely, I think when preached in a way that said that we understand where human beings are at and we understand how the gospel can, can touch their lives, um, th I think that's good preaching. Yes. Wh wh whatever whatever mm -hmm. style or whatever else comes out of it, I think, mm -hmm. I think that is powerful. And I think that person will say it's relevant. Yes. You know? Well, why do you think, and I, and I as, a, as a woman of the gospel, I know the answer to this, but for people who are struggling now and maybe their faith is kind of teeter-tottering mm -hmm. a little bit, maybe with everything around them and things are going through, they're questioning, uh, not ne maybe not necessarily God, but, mm -hmm. necessar but, but maybe their faith yeah. or where they are. Yeah. Uh, why would you say to them, the church, the church as God intended is still relevant to yeah. their lives. Well, um, I, I think that, I think I would say to them it is still relevant, relevant because it speaks to the deepest of human longings. Um, I, I, you know, there, there are those, obviously not everybody is Christian and, and we live in a society that's much more pluralistic. There's mm -hmm. a lot of different religions and a lot of different mm -hmm. beliefs. And, and so the, the landscape of Christian, or excuse me, of American culture is is so much very different than it was 50 years ago. And there were there there were negatives and positives then, and negatives and positives about the, about that now. Um, but but I think in, in the end of the in the end of the day, um, we have those who do not believe in Christianity. I I think they're going to struggle for to meet those deepest of human mm -hmm. longings than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and in other words, most of the people I hear as critiques to the faith um, are, are critiquing us without really giving a, an answer or a better answer mm -hmm. than, than what Christ offers uh, for those answers. And so because of that, I, I think that um, I think I think deep down all of us are 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 struggling with our own wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yes. I think to myself, I think to mm -hmm. myself, you know, that that dirty word that a lot of people don't want to mm -hmm. use, sin, yes. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but I think when I think about that, I think about how much in my life, with apart from the gospel of, of Jesus, that I've that I have, um, I condescend myself, how much I hate myself, how much I dislike myself mm -hmm. because of the wrong things that I've done, how that deflates me, how that disintegrates mm -hmm. me. 
and how I long for redemption. Um, that longing for redemption, it's in our movies, it's yes. in our stories, mm -hmm. it's in our novels, it's, it's everywhere. And so I think, the, I think the message is still really relevant. Um, I, I get it, it's an ancient, it's an old message, but, but it's one that, uh, and I, once again, I've been around the world, and I find that everybody is looking for um, redemption at, at some point, in some way, something that makes their life fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the gospel still does that. My daddy's daddy used to say, I, I'm, I'm not perfect, I'm redeemed. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, as, I, I, as I aged, I, I became to uh, come to understand that so well and to appreciate that so well because without redemption, I don't know where I would yeah. be yeah. because I simply could not measure up to uh, the world's mm -hmm. definition of, of perfection, yeah. but certainly I can measure up to excellence sure. in Christ Jesus. Sure. And, and I'm really grateful for redemption. Yes. Um, what are the spiritual and personal characteristics that you believe that every pastor ought to have in a local church? Well, um, I, I think that uh, uh, there's, there's some, I think, pretty obvious ones at the beginning, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, you've got to have integrity. If you don't have integrity, you don't have trust from, mm -hmm. from people. And, um, and, and we have that problem amongst us in, in the churches. We have, we have leadership that um, at times has, has fallen into temptation and has has done things that have lost their lost the trust of people and um, and so I think it's I think you have to guard that with with everything that you have um, and so I think that's part of it I, I think there obviously I think there's a need for your own spiritual nourishment mm -hmm. I think that pastors that aren't being spiritually nurtured um, in, in some way you know preaching sermons teaching classes um, this doesn't fulfill our spiritual nourishment we, we need to gain that elsewhere um, we'll find ourselves empty in a lot of ways. And in fact, uh, burnout is a danger for pastors. Yes. That, and mm. especially around the 20 year mark of ministry, it can be a very dangerous burnout uh, or d dangerous problem. Um, but, but I think two things that I would highlight that might be a little less obvious, even though when you hear them, they, they mm -hmm. may seem you know, not, not that grand. The first one is, I think you have to love the people you serve. Yes, I, it's, it sounds really simple, mm -hmm. um, but I love the story Jesus tells of the good shepherd. He calls himself the good shepherd. Mm -hmm. He says he's not a hireling. When the wolf comes, he's not going to run. He's he's going to lay down his life for the sheep, and because the sheep know his voice, and and they have this connection, this love connection there that is just extremely powerful. Um, and and I think you have to love the people you lead. I think that comes across, or it doesn't come across in in lots of ways. And the final thing I would say this is, is we need to be visionaries for a mission. We need to begin to think about how, our, how we lead our churches to impact our cities and our world. Um, if, we, if we don't do that, we become very much a closed organization. And so, so pastors are, are, are needing to ignite the imagine, mission and imaginations of their people. Um, in my opinion, we, we made a mistake by saying, come and be a Christian and everything will be safe and nice mm -hmm. and neat. I think people will become bored with that. Yes. I think we need to articulate that the faith is an adventure. Mm -hmm. It's full of risk. Oh, it puts yes. you on the edge. Mm -hmm. um, it's a challenge. And I think people will respond to that because I think that will ignite the, um, that human desire to be significant in the world. And, we, and only our mission can, can do that. And, um, and, and part of that for me has been trying to do that myself yes. um, in, in many different contexts. Well, in, in that vein that about mission, I know mission can take place locally, mm -hmm. but in terms of global mission, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the things you've done at Heartland Worship Center? Yeah. What would be your recommendation as we are almost closing yeah. down for this segment? Well, we, we're, we're a part of a, a denominational effort to send out missionaries all over the world, but we do some things directly ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we have one of the things that's become very prominent in our church has been short-term mission trips. And I, I think this year we're sending out around 15 short-term teams, um, some, some in Kentucky and, this, and then most of those around the world. Um, one of our partners is, is a group called Compassion International. Compassion International is a child sponsorship program. Uh, we, we encourage our folks to sponsor, even if they don't go on a mission mm -hmm. trip, they can, for about $40 a month, really provide the physical, educational, and spiritual 
resources for children all over the world who are in poverty. We, and, and one of the things that God's blessed us to be able to do is send teams to the places where mm -hmm. we sponsor children. So um, while my family sponsors a couple different children, I've gotten to meet a little girl in Ecuador that we send, and, and she had all the letters we sent her, <laughs> and it's just a real blessing when it comes to that. Um, we're, we're involved in some clean water projects around. Uh, we have, we have we just have gotten involved in trying to minister to those who are um, enslaved in human trafficking. Uh, some 30 million people are enslaved in human trafficking yes. around mm -hmm. our world. Uh, 30,000 children die every day from malnutrition or diseases mm -hmm. that are preventable. So, so it, the, the brokenness in our world is so rampant and, it, and it's a shame when Christians lack a response to that. Um, we're, doing, we're doing work in, in Thailand with a group of people who have never heard the gospel before. It's, wow. it's very, they're, they're called an unreached people group. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much cutting edge in, on terms of, of um, w there is no missionary work in them. Our church, by sending teams, we're, we're the missionary to them. And there's several other things, but that's become a very powerful part mm -hmm. of our church is trying to impact the world. As a mission-minded pastor, a mission-minded human being mm -hmm. who is a pastor, uh, do you think that the church can be as effective as it should be without global mission work? No, you know, I, first of all, it, it, the, the church, in my, my estimation, if I could make a prediction, I would say that any church that doesn't begin to not only preach its message, but to meet the practical needs of people in its city and world, is going to be a church that we'll see fade over the next 20 or 30 years. Wow. I, I think I think mm -hmm. our younger generation, they, they care about the world. Yes. They care about what happens to mm -hmm. the world. They don't want a religion mm -hmm. that just is talk or, mm -hmm. or just doc. I think talk and teaching and doctrine is important, mm -hmm. but they don't want just that. You know, John says that um, in his in his letter, he says that that we need to. Um, um, basically uh, show the love of Jesus in word and in deed. Yes. And so I, my, my belief is to any pastors out there, that I think mission will ignite your church. Mm -hmm. I think that it has to be the, the outward mission that, that has to do that. Um, and for us, that happens both locally and globally. Yes. Uh, we, we, and, and if you have one without the other, you really are not following the mandate to go into all the ends of the mm -hmm. earth. And, um, and we're, we've been blessed because we have a very powerful local mission and we started there, we, we've grown out to a global mission that, that's been, been extremely powerful. Um, but but that, that's there not only to, to make a difference in the world, that's there to make a difference in our people. Here, here's what we routinely hear from folks mm -hmm. when they're involved. I went to bless somebody else. You've heard this before. Yes. <laughs> I went to bless somebody else and I ended up being changed by yes. it. And so this is part of our discipleship. Mm -hmm. whether, whether what we do changes somebody or not, we have to sacrifice and be generous mm -hmm. and love like Jesus. If we don't do that, then, um, and, and not just here locally, um, I, I, you know, the, the first mission trip that ever took place was Jesus coming to us. Absolutely. And, and so we, we have to be concerned about the world as well. Well, this generation of youth mm -hmm. who are involved in a global mission, mm -hmm. a global mission work, because it's work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it's good work. Yeah. Uh, when, we put, when we bring our children along, then of course they become the men and the women who continue mm -hmm. the global mission. Mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, that reverberates yeah. all around yeah. the world, makes our communities better, our churches better, our families better, uh, make men better husbands mm -hmm. and fathers and mm -hmm. women better wives yes. and mothers. Yes. And then our relationship around the world uh, is a better relationship as opposed to uh, America being the rich mm -hmm. and the entitled country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then the rest are looked down on, right. upon or, or, or what have you. But this, the, the global mission uh, of the church, uh, it, it bridges the gap in my opinion. It's kind of like education it is in the community. Mm -hmm. Well, between us and the rest of the yeah. world, it bridges the gap between the lost and, yeah. and the found, I guess I could say. Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, also along with that is, is that without, um, without that sort of mission, you, I, I think your faith can easily become very narrow mm -hmm. in sight. Mm -hmm. uh, you can think that the way that I experience God right here is, is that, that's, that's all there is of God. And what you find is that um, cultures all around the world are experiencing God. And, and so to go and to experience those cultures and to see how, how, how God through Jesus is working in, uh, in those cultures, it expands your view of what, what's happening. And you mentioned, you mentioned our children. Um, had the opportunity about a year and a half ago to take my oldest daughter, who's about to turn 14, 
on one of our mission trips to Ecuador, and it was important to me because I wanted her to see, um, I wanted her to see that that if she, if she says she's rich or poor, I wanted her to judge that by the world's economy, wow. not by her neighborhood. Wow! And she she got to walk into mm -hmm. homes that mm -hmm. have you know wooden slats on the second floor, and you can see right through them, and the roof is cardboard with with duct tape on them and um, of course no running water, air conditioning, um, electricity, all things that we have. And tell me if you've heard this story before, um, a, a, a mom and dad work for everything they have to become very, very successful, give their kids everything they wanted. And, and the, the child though did not go through the process to mm. get there to be able yes. to really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, and so that's, that's the case for many of our children. And, and if that's the case, then we've got to be able to show them the realities of the world. And I desire, you know, I, I have four children, but I desire my kids to be people of compassion and people of purpose. And, um, and, and, I, and my goal as a parent is not, how do I just keep them safe and mm -hmm. successful? Mm -hmm. I want them to be significant. Significant. And, and, oh, I, and I, I wanna, love that. I want to bring that into their lives so that they matter to the world. That's mm -hmm. what, I, that's what I, I pray for my kids every night when mm -hmm. I pray for them. I say, may the world be different because they're, because they're in it. You know, may the world be different. Churches grow. They're more effective. They're better. They reach uh, more unsaved, the unchurched, yeah. and they gather back those who are saved but somehow walked away for a minute yeah. or so. Yeah. And, uh, but I find them to be the most spiritually uh, and local and globally minded churches mm -hmm. in our country. And, and, the, and the difference between those that are and those that are not are very clear, yeah. clearly defined. Yeah. Pastor Joyce, I, I thank you so much for being on the Heart of Collaboration. I'm looking forward to you co-hosting uh, for our pastor series. Yes. There will be uh, various topics, mm -hmm. topics that you choose, maybe. I'll try to be your Michael Strahan. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll try to be. Your, I'll, 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 try, I'll try to help out all I can. I think it'll be the other, other way around. <laughs> uh, but we're going to be fulfilling uh, some comments and suggestions and some yeah. needs from many people who've talked to me one-on-one. -on -one. And so I'm looking forward to that. I want to say again, thank you for having us into your viewing audience. This has been Reverend Dr. Nathan Joyce, who is the pastor of Heartland Worship Center in the great Paducah, Kentucky. And we look forward to coming back to you again. Again, contact me when you have ideas and suggestions because this is your show. I just happen to be blessed to be your host and producer, but I do consider this to be your television show. Thank you, and we look forward to being in your viewing audience again real soon. Thank you.